Okay, it's time for our final presenter for the mini-conf, Matthew Lai. Hey, you doing? Can you hear me well? All right. <laughs> um, I'll try and be quick because I know you're probably all looking forward to dinner already. Um, I work for Griffith University. Um, a large part of what I do is I develop um, SOE environments for desktops, um, which is a little different. Um, I also do a lot of server work. Um, for them as well, but most of what I do is um, in uh, deploying and managing um, desktop environments. Um, my position is a senior computing support officer within their student uh, computing uh, team. I'll talk more about what uh, we actually do with that later. Um, in the Linux world, I'm a board member on a few Ubuntu community projects, mostly to do with um, user education and things like that, and uh, Ubuntu member. I've used a heck of a lot of Linux distributions, um, both evaluating them for uh, my purposes for work and just because I like to tinker around with stuff. Um, I'm not going to try and explain how to build an SOE in 20 minutes. I'm not that good. Um, <laughs> it took me a long time to work it out, and I doubt I could communicate anything close to that. Um, we're not probably going to have a lot of time for discussion, but um, there's a birds of a feather session um, tomorrow, which is um, dedicated to that. And I know there's a couple other people that do this kind of thing who I'm looking to get in touch with there. So if you have any interest in this kind of stuff at all, um, please come along. Um, I'm not going to be talking about how to use LTSP to build a thin client SOE. That's kind of been covered to death by um, Edge One Two over the years, and there's a heck of a lot of documentation on it. Um, what I want to do is, as it says, uh, give you an idea of how to start working on an SOE, um, some of the lessons I've learned, some of the, the things I've had to get around in building environments, and um, kind of get a, a primer for things to discuss about for that session as well so we can get some good discussion. Because um, a lot of the stuff, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about how to do this. I've only been doing it for about uh, four years now, so I've still got a long way to go before I can call myself a real expert on that sort of stuff. Um, Griffith is a pretty big university um, with a very, very varied um, uh, student pool. Uh, we've got 4,500 machines, of which um, over 350 of them run Linux. Uh, another massive chunk runs Mac, and um, that proportion is constantly increasing, um, mostly due to the um, engineering um, and the IT schools, which um, are really preferring to use Linux now because of the advantages it gives them for teaching their students. Um, our image is based on Ubuntu 8.10. Um, the reason for that is uh, prior to the current version of Ubuntu, there was no kernel uh, backporting done. So when uh, SATA 3 controllers came out, uh, everything based on 10.4 wouldn't work anymore. Uh, 8.4 wouldn't work anymore. Um, so the easiest way to get it working is to go out one version, unfortunately. Um, we use network-based home directories for students, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, centrally authenticated logins. And um, I've actually set them both to connect up to both um, uh, novel directory and um, active directory environments. So I've got documentation that I'm giving out to talk about how to do both of those as well. But in a nutshell, um, what the university runs is a centrally authenticated client um, with networked homes that travel uh, with students. Um, what we're really going to cover is um, briefly how to configure the network home directories. So there's a lot to it and a lot of fiddly bits. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how to lock down um, changes to the GNOME uh, GUI. Um, there's a lot of stuff on how to do that, so I'm only going to cover a small amount of it. Um, managing changes to large environments, which tends to be the biggest problem when you start to have 350 machines you have to be able to push changes to. How do you manage that? You can't really have someone running around and typing something at every desktop. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the lobby environment. Um, that is often a handy way to start off when you're looking at um, building Linux SOEs because it's really simple to deploy out and work with. And some of the imaging and deployment um, issues. I'm not going to cover centralized authentication um, because of time and because it's something that's pretty well documented. Um, network homes. Um, all our network homes are mounted through NFS. Um, the home on the local machine is actually an auto mount, which mounts uh, home directories on the server. Um, and that mount contains a pseudo password file, which is used to authenticate clients, which gives them things like their Unix attributes, which I've yet to find anything which handles attributes and groups well um, for connecting into anything designed for a Windows environment. Um, the uh, password file is copied on boot, and um, as the machines boot up, they just accept whatever they get handed from the home directory. So as long as your user has a valid home already, it looks like it's on a local machine to a user, so they can't see anything. Um, locking down GNOME, 
Um, there's two real ways to do it, aside from using a uh, nice little GUI to like uh, the last slot showed. Um, but the, the easiest way I found to do it to get really granular control over what sort of settings you want to apply is to use the command line tool or the GUI tool. Um, I prefer the command line tool just because it's simpler to execute commands through. Um, all, all of the um, entries in the uh, in the well, it's almost like a registry for um, for GNOME uh, have three states, which is the user um, for default, which adds it to the skeleton user for the system, or a mandatory one, which cannot be changed unless you're administrator. Um, so mandatory tags are really good for enforcing things like uh, if you want to have a corporate desktop environment and you want to enforce uh, a layout, you want to enforce what icons show up on the desktop, things like that, you can set them as mandatory and they cannot be changed. They can add things, they just can't remove anything. Um, there's the different options there. Um, we've just gone and showed one fairly simple command just to say, all right, show a trash icon on the desktop, make it a little more Windows-like, and then the different ways to do that. So you can set it, as set it, unset it, um, make it a uh, mandatory or a default. Um, here's a couple of the really good ones um, that uh, I find useful. Um, things to do with the background setting. Um, your background image as a default or a mandatory is very good. Uh, default would uh, mostly be for a more um, staff or academic environment, in my case. Um, whereas uh, setting it as mandatory means your users can't screw around with the desktop. Um, a lot of what we do is locking down the panel. Um, we found that a lot of the errors we'd have when people came in and they complained that something wasn't working, they'd gone and changed something, and then something else changed and it broke. And when it broke, they didn't like it, and they complained that we screwed them. Um, so what we did is uh, we changed a lot of these settings here, which it talks about, like uh, locking down. Um, basically says you can't make any changes to any panels. It prevents you from even right-clicking on them, so it doesn't show you anything. Um, you can disable things like locking the screens, which is great if your students want to leave a lab and lock a machine for a few hours. That's, that's handy. Um, disabling logout, or um, this one, next one particularly is disabling applet. If you have uh, 3,000 or 4,000 valid logins for a machine, and you have a lovely applet like GNOME does, the fast user switching, and it tries to show three and a half thousand entries, guess what happens? <laughs> Your system crashes really fast. Um, disabling user switching. Um, user switching, while it's nice, can have some odd effects that it doesn't always run all scripts. So if you have scripts that start on boot up, they don't always work, or even ones that start on session. And um, disabling locking the screen is there twice for some reason. All right. Um, other things, uh, disabling hibernation suspend, they give the same sort of problems as locking screens as well. Um, next thing I want to talk about is uh, managing and implementing change, which is the largest part of what I have to deal with. Um, one of the tools that we use for that is uh, cluster SSH. It's basically the same as a standard SSH terminal, um, except it allows you to access lists of machines within a uh, single session. Um, so for a large pile of identity conf identically configured machines such as labs, it makes a really easy way to react and do quick on-the-spot changes to machines. Um, and it's great fun when you get your first-year students who sit down and the first thing they do when they get access to a server is they start trying to break things. And it's just great scaring the crap out of them by making stuff pop up and vanish. Uh, all right, so this is basically the way it works. You define your clusters of machines. Um, and then you uh, set up what machines you want in the clusters. You can also group up um, labs as well. So you could have uh, something you want to be doing which is coming across all environments, or you could do it based on specific um, groups um, that are, th are the same. And then um, you just access groups by calling it like this, and it will open up um, a single GUI window with a whole bunch of background ones, which basically gives you a view of what's happening on each uh, machine you're connected to. So if anything errors out, you can quickly identify it and select that particular window and make changes to fix any problems that might come up. All right, uh, the second way we do it, and my preferred way, is um, by using boot scripts. Now, I know you can use all sorts of lovely things. I preferred my manual way of doing it, so I stuck with it. There's a lot of that. Um, but what we've got set up is we've got another auto mount um, that runs um, as one of the first things that runs on startup. And um, it allows us to put files on there that we want to be installed or executed and allows us to have a script um, running that updates itself. 
on startup. So what we did is we took the rc.local script because it was already designed as a lost hook for login, uh, for startup before login, and we uh, made a couple changes to it. So the first thing it did is it updated itself and an update script. You don't want to have rc.local update anything and then run itself again, because if you do anything slightly wrong, everything stops working. Um, so what it does is it queries the server, checks and see if it's got an update, and then updates itself, updates any other files it has to, and then calls the update script, which then runs, and then makes any other changes. We run a local uh, mirror, so anything we want to change or install, installs pretty much instantaneously. So any uh, lecturer can come up and say, oh, I'm starting a lab in uh, 10 minutes, and uh, I need a new program installed. And we can say, yep, no problem. Tell us what it is. And by the time he gets there, they start it up, and it's ready to go. Um, this is kind of handy because it allows us to get a little bit more granular too because with each machine you can specify different uh, files at the other end that it's accessing. So you can have a lovely little network of files and even um, at the moment um, because uh, most of our environments are um, pretty well standardized, um, we have a single file for each lab which at the moment is just a, um, a symbolic link to a generic script again. Um, but the benefit of doing this is on each local machine, it thinks it's got its own script on the server, and if we want to make changes to specific labs, we're able to do that without uh, the user seeing anything or being aware, even aware something happened or changed before they started up the machine. Um, this just gives you a really basic idea of how the script works. A lot of stuff's missing. Um, but basically what it does is it waits for the mount to exist. If it doesn't exist, it can't really use it. As um, soon as it's got a mount, it um, checks itself, updates, um, pulls down a couple other key scripts that need to be there, um, and then <laughs> runs a lovely little idle shutdown script that we've got. If anyone wants an idle shutdown script that shuts down your machine, they're very, very handy. Um, and then runs its update script, so it updates itself at the end. It's really, really simple, um, but really, really effective, and runs really, really quick quickly. Um, one of the other things I wanted to cover really quickly is um, the Wubby. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually heard of this tool or used it. Has anyone used this tool before at all? A couple people. Um, this tool was originally um, created because it's a nice way to get uh, users into using Linux um, in a really safe way. They don't have to start mucking around with partitions. They don't have to install anything on the hard drive directly. It actually installs it within a container file in um, an NF NTFS partition. Um, the benefit of this is if you do install um, a uh, SOE environment and build an SOE environment in one of these disks, it's very easy to put it into dual boot environments. So rather than managing uh, two um, OSs on a single disk, which does start to create headaches when you start imaging things across large um, scales, it allows you to create a file that can be copied into any image you want to create it as a dual boot and set up a dual boot environment off a lab that was previously a Windows environment in about 15 minutes, which is a lot faster than any other way I've found to do it. Um, it has a couple downsides, um, but so far I haven't found they've actually given any problems. Um, and so far, uh, of the 350 Linux machines, we have that running on about 100 of them, um, and we've yet to have a single problem created by it. Um, but the big thing is it creates um, a series of files, and you simply have to copy um, two .disk files into whichever machine you want to have it on and install the application, and you're ready to go. Um, imaging deployment. Um, recently, uh, Linux decided um, to change its default inode side for partitions to 120, uh, 256 um, bits from uh, 128. This was lovely, um, except that they didn't tell a lot of people they were going to do it. So a lot of applications that people normally use, like Symantec, didn't update. So if you tried to image anything that previously worked, uh, it would suddenly fail. Um, and the only way you could actually image any Linux disk after they did that using Ghost was in a raw mode, which was incredibly painful. Um, so one of the things that uh, actually forced us to do is look at alternates, um, because the updates were unfortunately pretty slow in coming. And uh, there was a talk earlier about Clonezilla, and it's actually a, a really, really good solution. Um, and we actually started using it in favor of Ghost in some circumstances, simply because it was faster, um, and we didn't have as many problems with the Linux side. It did have a couple of us with Windows and dual boot environments that we weren't expecting, 
um, but they were pretty easy to uh, get through. Um, I was pretty quick, <laughs> and I figure some people will have questions. Um, so if anyone's got questions, um, I'd love to answer any if you have them now. Otherwise, um, there's the discussion session tomorrow as well. Does your RC local method scale at all? I mean, uh, what do you mean by scale? Well, I can see cases where you're trying to update a lab of machines. Yep. It might work great if you've got 10 machines that you need to update. Yep. But if you're talking hundreds of machines, yep. thousands of machines potentially, does that not cause problems for you? Um, the good thing about doing it through rc.local is it does it on boot. So no machine will be booted. You know, you won't have 400 machines booting at the exact same second, so it's not too bad. Um, I have tested it with 100 machines doing wake on LAN and forced them all to do it at the same time just to see how long it took. Um, and because we had a, a local mirror, it was still coming off very quickly, and there was only about 15 seconds extra delay in the login. Um, that being said, for most environments, I wouldn't expect that they're going to uh, be updating more than you know a couple of machines at a time. Um, that being said, you know if you're going to dump you know a couple of gig worth of packages to it, it's probably not the best way to do it. That sort of thing. Um, what I generally do is do a um, cluster SSH thing, last thing before I leave for the night, wake everything up, and then uh, just set a command to say shut down when you're done, and then come in the next morning, everything's working. Uh, uh, regarding the startup script that you have uh, on the server, um, uh, w when they use a uh, login and access the script, how does it, how, how do they access, access it? I assume that it uh, allows the user to auto mount uh, directories or... Okay, so you want to know how the, how the actual mounting bit works for the script? Yes. Alright, um, so basically um, there's an auto mount set up uh, for the machine using a, a little program called auto mounter. Um, what that does is it runs um, as part of the um, boot process and it mounts NFS partitions as if they're local folders. So, um, there's a couple different mounts. There's one which is an export one, which is just so we can dump information to local machines. There's one which uh, mounts the homes, the slash home. And there's another one we have which is called slash source, um, which mounts a NFS partition on a uh, machine that has all the information we want. And um, it's our um, desktop sysadmin server that we use. And um, so any scripts you want to add or any programs or anything that we can't pull from a repository that we want to deploy, um, all that happens is it's put on um, this server. And um, when rc.local boots up, the first thing it does is it checks the server and to see if it's, um, if it's ready yet. As soon as it's available, it uh, connects to that and um, pulls down a local copy of itself. So it effectively replaces um, its file and the update file. Um, so if we want to make any changes to the rc.local script, we're, we can do that um, directly through that. Or um, when it uh, copies the that update script is where we pretty much put any sort of changes we want to make, which is executed straight after the rc.local. So all it does is it runs an R, um, a rsync um, from the rc.local saying replace me with what's in source, because um, we know where the target file is going to be, and it just pulls itself straight across again, along with the update script as well. Does that uh, explain that? OK. Um, we need to be out of the building by quarter two, so there's time for one more question. Make it a good one. Looking at the way you maintain the machines and they use uh, PAM and NFS to get home directories, I'm assuming users don't have sudo rights no, to they the don't. machines. No. Um, in any large environment, that's the first thing you take away from users because it's painful. <laughs> any, I mean, it, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I also administrate a very large chunk of Windows machines as well. And, I mean, if you can in any way whatsoever, that's the first thing you want to take away from people because it stops them from breaking things. If somebody really needs something, especially in this environment, we can give the two of them really quickly. I mean, it's a matter of they reboot their machines and it's going to be there ready for them unless it's a pretty major package. Um, so we didn't really see the need to give them any sort of admin rights and um, anything specifically that they need to do. Um, we can uh, add things to the sudoers file and things like that mm -hmm. to allow them to do something um, that they wouldn't normally be able to do if it's something that we think is controllable. My other, again, going on from that, not having a student screw up the environment, but 
if the machine does get into an unworkable state, is it a you use Clonezilla to just redeploy the machine? Yep. Um, so what we can do is we've got a nice managed PXE, um, which is a commercial thing that the university bought, which makes my life easy because it means I can pick a machine and tell it the PXE boot. Um, at which point I can just dump an image back to it, and 10 minutes later, it's 15 minutes later, it's ready to go. Which software? Um, they use Argon. Right. If you can all join me in thanking the speaker. Yeah. The only other thing, um, at that site there's also copies of the... Um, the documentation for the build um, for our image environment, including uh, the setups for the uh, network logins as well. So if anyone is interested, um, there's documentation there which will help you out. <laughs> presentation. <laughs> it got cut off a little bit. Yeah, it's just presentation. Um, okay. It's also linked in the wave as well. So if you're on the wave, grab it straight out of there. Thank you all very much for coming. This is the end of the mini -conf. Um, we have to be out of the building by quarter two, so you've got about five minutes to pack up and leave. Just before you all go, uh, with my LCA volunteer hat on, I have a little gift to say thank you to Simon Lyle for organising the mini-conf.